Hi everybody, this is Scott McLeod with another episode of the Coronavirus Chronicles. I have with me today Brandon Johnson. He's the Area Superintendent of Curriculum and Instruction in Mansfield ISD, which is in Mansfield, Texas. And uh, Brandon is new to his role. He's only been in there about six weeks or so. Before that, he was the principal at one of the high schools in the district. Brandon, thanks for being with us. Hey, great to be here. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about uh, Mansfield as a school district. Who do you serve? Where are you located? You know, what are you trying to make happen? So, so Mansfield is located uh, right in between Dallas and Fort Worth. And uh, we are about... Uh, about 15, 20 minutes south, uh, uh, right in the middle of um, Dallas and Fort Worth. And so if you're familiar with the Dallas Cowboys uh, and they, their uh, new stadium is in Arlington and, and we're just south of that. Uh, our district is about 36,000 students. And so we're considered a mid-sized district. We've got um, um, uh, a very diverse population uh, that we serve. and. Uh, and we're majority minority campuses. We've got campuses that are um, all over the, the wavelength and, and how we serve students from Title I to um, some really affluent campuses. So um, we're just in the business of uh, doing a great job of educating kids and, and uh, proud to be an A school district. Awesome. So Raina, obviously the spring was a big kerfluffle for everybody. So what did transitioning to remote look like there in Mansfield? And what are some things that you thought maybe um, you wish you'd done better or things that had gone well? Well, um, when we went, when we shut down, um, it was interesting because everything started happening while we were on spring break. And um, it, it seemed like we were gonna come, come back out of spring break, but then, um, <laughs> we we got notification that we were going to pause, uh, and we were taking it two weeks at a time. And uh, and then the governor made that decision for us, and and he went ahead and and shut Texas down and said that we were gonna um, we were gonna be shut down through the the beginning of April, and then he extended that that order. And it was it was surreal, honestly, at the beginning. Uh, it was like, is this really happening? And, you know, kind of like kids, you're like, okay, we have a, the, the first thing that, that we thought was, oh, we've got an extended spring break. Um, but what really started happening was we were scrambling, you know, I, I kind of think of, think of it like uh, the Flintstones, you know, our feet were running below and we were scrambling to try to make sure that uh, we could provide quality um, uh, to our students and parents. And so uh, it, it was a mad dash at the beginning, and then we we did a, a great job of um, really relying on our our campus principals and our um, and our assistant principals and and staff to to really uh, do do the great things that they that they that they ended up doing for kids. So um, it was uh, uh, March was was interesting. Uh, April was a little bit more normal, and then by May, um, it was it, as if we had been doing it for months. Uh, and you you would have thought that um, we had, we had started the year that way because our kids adapted did such a great job of adapting. Our teachers did a phenomenal job of adapting. But at the end of May, everybody was tired. Yeah, absolutely. So what are some decisions you made early on, either as a building principal or as a district, um, that seem to um, contribute to your success in the spring? Um, so I would say my success as a building principal came from the direction of uh, the guidance that I was getting from my district. And so our, our district leadership, um, they wanted, they felt like the best way to get to the student was to go through the teacher. And so I echoed that on my campus, and I really put a lot of te a lot of power in the hands of the teachers because they they had the the most direct contact with our students. So when we decided to try to you know uh, connect with every student, we heavily relied on teachers uh, uh, to notify us who they hadn't gotten in contact with, and then we worked through the process. And and this just goes to show I, I don't think teachers get enough credit. Um, especially over COVID of the job that they do with connecting with kids. 
we with with our our size of high school we were 2600 students uh, and depending on the part the point of the year we were 2700 students you know we had less than within within two days we had less than one page of students that we hadn't had contact with and to me that was just amazing because um our teachers did a fantastic job of connecting with kids and so um continuing that on we began uh, as as campus leaders to really focus on the needs of the teachers and um, making sure that we were involved in our, our PLCs and making sure we could figure out what barriers uh, that they were experiencing. And we tried to immediately remove those barriers. And so um, I would say that that's what led to our success. Um, you know, your, every organization is just as good as the people that it has. And, and we, have some, we have some pretty good ones. Right. So Brandon, what has, support looked like for kids and families uh, at home from the district? Um, so support for us has been uh, access to resources uh, and information. And so whether it be hotspots or um, uh, getting them devices or uh, giving them information about who is offering uh, free Wi-Fi, because we do have a, we do really have a unique situation where um, even some of our, our leadership uh, they live in areas that are within our school district that are that are still on the verge of their rural, and so the infrastructure is not there, and so they can walk from one part of their house to the other part of their house, have strong signal to dropping signal, and uh, they were experiencing those things, and so they were uh, be because they were experiencing that, it gave us a, a window to what was happening in those areas with our our uh, our families. And so uh, we, we really sought out to just put out as much information as possible to provide them access to information and resources. And, uh, and we continued to listen to feedback. So as a, as a, as a campus principal, um, the, the calls that I was fielding were things that um, were parents were embarrassed to, to tell their teacher about. Um, there were problems um, that I never imagined, for instance, uh, Mr. Johnson, I've been, I've been furloughed and I'm not working right now. And uh, right now, I know that you're expecting my, my child to um, attend school, but my, my child's working 40 hours at Waterburger. And so I, I need to know how I can best help my child because my child is also helping the family. And so it really gave us a, a viewpoint of what our families were experiencing. And so I, in turn, gave that information to teachers, and we we really tried to to be adaptable and flexible with working with students that were having uh, difficult times. Absolutely. So, Brandon, what are some of those structures or sort of evolving mechanisms that popped up this spring that you hope you might hang on to in the fall as a school or district? Well, the number one thing that I want to hold on to is the connection and the communication. Um, you know, a lot of times when we're face to face, uh, we hear that teachers aren't communicating with parents and our community did a, did us, a, a, they gave us great feedback on, uh, how we were communicating. They said, whoa, 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 <laughs> we're getting so much information, uh, and so many emails and so many phone calls from teachers. We would like you to streamline that and create one source. And so, um, I think it's always great that we get feedback that says that we're over communicating versus under communicating. So I would love to see that continue moving forward. But our, our next steps are to move from the emergency learning of being uh, a remote learning from shutdown to being um, true, uh, truly proficient and even move to uh, masters of blended learning. And so as, as we look at reopening uh, this coming year, that that's that's our focus our focus is is to improve upon the instructional uh practices that we had started uh in, in the spring and as we move forward we we want to create those virtual experiences for kids and and do it in a technology rich environment yeah absolutely so yeah i was hoping we could kind of segue in the summer um, cause nobody really knows what fall is going to look like. I know that cases are still surging in Texas in many locations. And so it's, you know, 
anybody's guess whether we're going to be partially face to face, wholly online, something in between, <laughs> right? Like, mm -hmm. nobody, we're going to dip in and out of different modalities. So, what has um, training and support for teachers looked like over the summer? Um, so, as I've as I've uh, transitioned into my role, I've got a, I've got a chance to really. Uh, step back and learn, take a learner's posture and view what's happening with my counterparts. And so um, one of my counterparts, she has been uh, just, you know, moving 100 miles an hour just to uh, get coordinate everything uh, from professional from professional development um, for principals to uh, teachers. And so she leads our uh, department of instruction and <clears throat> Her focus has been making sure that we have a principal training component, a teacher training component, and then we we uh, her focus has also been on onboarding new teachers. And so, um, you know, I'm looking at her in amazement because um, she's got this you know giant puzzle that she's working with, and and when when we look at how we're supporting our teachers. I feel like we're in a really good position um, compared to the way we were in the spring, you know, because the spring was, uh, we're shut down and now uh, we got to figure it out. To now, we have had the summer to really plan uh, intentionally how we want teachers uh, to grow and develop. And so a lot of our, a lot of our sessions are, are full and jam packed because teachers, teachers want the training that's being offered. And, and we've listened to them. Yeah. So, Brandon, this is all fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I've been working with a few districts around the country. And one of the things I've been trying to emphasize is that, particularly on the remote side, is that because we were in emergency uh, mode in the spring, in, in a lot of districts and schools, mostly what we got out was kind of like homework-like and uh, worksheet-like uh learning right because that was the easiest stuff that we could get out quickly it might be a digital worksheet it might be a packet of stuff that we could throw in a backpack and throw in a bus and deliver to your house whatever but it wasn't sort of this higher level more engaging kind of learning right and i've been trying to stress to folks that i'm working with that you know in the spring families gave us some grace because it was an emergency mode and we had it you know it was only going to be for a couple months and whatever but i don't think they're going to give us that grace in the fall and so uh, I'm curious to your reactions to this idea that in the fall, um, particularly since we know at least some portion of our kids are going to be online and maybe most of them, um, this idea of designing for higher engagement, and how do we support teachers to do that? Any thoughts on that? Well, uh, the, the key to designing for higher engagement, is what I said earlier, is it's all about the experience. And so we take, we take students on a journey uh, with the content and they experience the content in, in, in such a different way face to face. And now it's our responsibility to take the next step and say, how do we provide a similar experience, uh, whether it be uh, in a dual mode, whether some of it be face to face, uh, virtually or in person, um, and then some of that being digitally asynchronously. And so uh, it's, it's got to start with uh, the, the idea that we want to create an experience. And then the next step is how do we want to extend that experience? Um, because I mean, you know, you or I, we, we don't remember a lot of the lessons that we were taught, but we remember their experiences. I remember when I was in eighth grade, I went to DC and I, you know, I, I was, I was at the tomb of the unknown soldier. I remember that because that was an experience for me. And so digitally and, re and remotely, we have to, pro we have to place kids there. Uh, and and um, that's going to take some very intentional planning, and uh, we've got to be consistent in in how we offer uh, those those media rich experiences. Yeah, I could not have said that any better. Nicely done. Um, so we're kind of nearing the end of our time here. Uh, what are the challenges that you're thinking about right now as you think about heading into the fall? So what's kind of keeping up at night? <laughs> You know, the, the number one thing that's keeping me up at night right now is um, what we're asking educators to do. You know, as, I move, as, as I've moved into this role, um, you know, part of me is, I, I think, is lucky. Um, but the other, because I don't, 
I'm, I'm seeing in a different light, but the other part of me is, is sad because, you know, you want to be in the trenches with your fellow um, colleagues. And um, what, what worries me is what we're asking educators to do. You're, you're exactly right earlier. Parents, parents have given us grace, but the expectation uh, um, increases as we go into the fall. But then also, you know, we've been thrust, we've been continually thrust into uh, environments where when, when, if you were to write down a T-chart of everything that we're asking a teacher to do, and then everything we're asking an administrator to do, it, it, it gets to the point of diminishing returns and we can't do any of it well. And so I just hope that leaders and teachers will remember that uh, th the best thing that you can do is, is focus on your kids and focus on uh, providing those experiences and, and really take time and, and practice self-care. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a little bit of a different message than sort of these content pushes that we're hearing from some of our policymakers who are worried about learning loss and so on, right? Like there seems to be uh, overwhelming concern with content as opposed to kids. Um, and so I love that you're taking this stance that the content will take care of itself if we take care of the kids in the relationship. Absolutely. Every time. Every time. Uh, anything else you want to share here at the end? No, I, I think that uh, this conversation has been fantastic and refreshing, and and uh, and I hope that it, you know some of the things we talked about um, provides some uh, validation for those who are experiencing some of the th some of the same things that we're experiencing here in Texas, and and I just you know implore everybody to keep your head up and and keep pushing because we are doing great things for kids and we are uh, doing a great job of educating kids. We absolutely are. Uh, Brandon, it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you today. Thanks for making some time with me. Uh, Mansfield, Texas, everybody, doing good stuff. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you.